We're waiting for parts for the main engine to arrive so we can put that back together. We've got a little bit of an update on that later on. But in the meantime, we're going to start working on these back tanks. We need to pressure test them so that we can identify where a leak is happening and then get it fixed. With little money, lots of support, Kiwi ingenuity and good old blood, sweat and tears, we're creating a community expedition and research boat built and run by volunteers from around the world because life is too short not to fight for your dream. I took a stroll downtown this evening When I heard music echo through the night The same old songs that I heard the night before So I started running so I wouldn't be too late I didn't think that I would ever see your face again But I was wrong, yeah I was wrong Hello, welcome to Project Brewpeg. The motor's taken apart, we're just waiting for parts to come back. Uh, Duncan's coming up to help Dame put it back together. Um, so we've got uh, three weeks between now and then. So we're assuming the parts will all be back, it looks like everything's tracking really well. That, that means we can get on with a few of the other jobs that we have to do for launching. Um, there's only a few, but one of them that's really important of course is making sure that all the tanks, the fuel tanks and the water tanks throughout the boat are uh, pressure tested and can seal really well. So just a little orientation, if you look that way, there's the motor. If you turn this way, you can see the port side back tank or day tank. That is full of diesel. All that diesel uh, needs to go into this tank because Damien needs to be able to weld the tiny little pinhole in the weld on the bung at the bottom. <laughs> that's all that's needed. This has been full of diesel. It's a great way to test a tank that, that it doesn't have any leaks because diesel just seeps into everything after a while um, and there's a good amount in there. So we, we're really happy with that tank. Everything's sealing well, just that one little pinhole. So what's the plan? What's the plan of attack for this then? The plan? The plan today. Um, so I need to basically get this, thing, this tank here behind me sealing up. There's a few things that we've added into this. We've added um, sight glass, so a couple of fittings that have been welded in. Um, also a bung that Jess mentioned earlier that's on the outside of the boat, this bung here, and this is where it's located. This is so that we can drain these tanks really fast and easy when we're on the hard. It's pretty normal for commercial boats to have these sort of drains in the fuel tanks. Um, the back tanks didn't have them, but the front four did, so we added bungs into these ones here. What I have found is on the opposite tank, there's a pinhole, and I don't know if my weld on this tank is perfect as well, so I'm going to pressure test this one. These back tanks haven't ever been pressure tested by us. So today's job is basically make gaskets needed to seal this up, um, putting the bolts on and tightening that up nice and tight, and then um, bunging up all of the fittings so that we don't have air leaks, and pushing in a couple of PSI of air pressure and walking around with a little soapy sprayer and see if there's any uh, leaks anywhere. And if there is, dealing with that, getting in there with a TIG welder and cleaning all of that up. <laughs> change is inevitable, darling. <laughs> yeah. Um, change is an illusion. No, it's time that's an illusion. We watched um, Matrix... The Matrix Resurrection, is that what it's called? The fourth movie. Uh, so we're both in like a Matrix mindset right now. <laughs> it's like everything is like time is an illusion and... I'll be bending over backwards dodging weld splatter. <laughs> <laughs> weld Those that don't remember, this is our rear fuel tank. So you can sort of see bare steel, fairly open, cavernous, doesn't have baffles, doesn't need baffles, it's not a big tank. We've got our filler over that side, and then all of the various pickups, as well as the open bung on this side. Now, what I have noticed is down on the ground here, let's see if I can show you, lots of rubbish. So we need to give it a bit of a clean before we get too carried away with this tank. Previously, I've cleaned this tank out to within an inch of its life. Then I coated the entire surface with axle oil so that we've got a nice, thick, gluggy oil that's just going to sit on the surface indefinitely. And it was probably a good 12 months ago that I did that tank, and it's looking like it's in fine condition, just needs a good vacuum to get all the rubbish off the bottom. A lot of that rubbish is actually sand from when we sandblasted the outside of the hull. It's come up through that bung and ended up in the tank. I need to just give it a bit of a vacuum before we get in there and start putting diesel into it. What I want to show you, you can see these fittings, this one here and that one just over there. 
they go through to pickups in the tank itself. So on the inside, you've got those two right angled fittings that sort of poke a pipe down to the bottom of the tank. That's important. We need to duplicate that, but in a bigger size. In order to pull fuel in and out of this tank as part of the transfer system, I need to make a one inch pipe that does a 90 degree curve, heads down to the bottom of the tank. I'm gonna use a one inch mild steel socket that gets welded into the bulkhead itself. And then onto that socket, I'm gonna be welding a stainless pipe. This is a piece of, I think this is like handrail or something off a pool or something like that. Um, but when I saw that in the scrap bin, I was immediately thinking, obviously that's a fuel transfer system. What I need to do on this piece of stainless is cut where it finishes its 90 degree radius and then tig that on and then also figure out what length I need down this part here for the tank. So first step, let's go and make this bit. Fancy welding aside, I want to tell you a story that's going to make engineers around the world cringe because something isn't symmetrical. When Brewpig was designed there was a tank on the port side and a tank on the starboard side. Now logically you'd think, let's separate it down the centre line here so that we can have two perfectly symmetrical tanks. That's not what was done here. If this is the centre line, obviously it makes sense to separate the tanks over here. That was just a pilot hole, obviously we need to go to a bigger size so we can get the hole saw in there. I don't know why they've designed it this way. It is possibly the most annoying way you could design these tanks. The bulkhead comes down here, you've got one tank that's absolutely piece of cake to clean and get to every part of it. On the starboard tank, you've got a slot that's basically really awkward to get to. You've got that much room to get all of your hands, cleaning gear, scrub buds, all of that sort of stuff over the side to clean the slot out. Uh, it's absolutely annoying, it's all buggery. So when we got the boat, this side of the tank was an absolute pigsty. It obviously hadn't been cleaned for years. What I'm hoping to do is to fix that problem by putting this fill and drain over on this side because what I want to do is flush that every time we put fuel in and out of that tank, I want to flush all that rubbish out into the main tank because then it can be picked up and filtered. Whereas if it sits over on this side, it's almost impossible to get to unless you physically climb inside the tank and clean it. If I can flush it every time I'm pumping fuel in and out, if I can flush it with the big pipe, it's not very likely to get blocked up, but at the same time it's also going to move that stuff around, which is what I want because then I can suck that fluid out and put it through the filtering system and actually get rid of the junk. I'd rather the junk be in the filters than in the bottom of the tank.
I need to make a gasket for the tank that we're about to seal up and to do that I use nitrile rubber so this black rubber is three millimeters thick and it's nitrile rubber which basically means diesel proof um, you can get other rubbers that are not nitrile but they just don't really hold up that great to diesel so um, if you're ever using gasket material make sure you got nitrile rubber when you do it and three millimeters is plenty thick you can get thicker but three millimeters is plenty thick um, to be able to seal up on these tanks so whatever warpage occurred when they were welding the flanges etc in isn't enough to be a problem if you're using um, three mil thick i did think maybe i should get six mil when i bought this but that was probably just being over cautious three seems to work quite well it's really important when you're cutting out this industrial rubber is to use the scissors that you promised your wife that you would buy to replace the last lot of scissors that you used which happened to still be in your toolbox but these are shinier newer and sharper so i'm going to use these and just beg for forgiveness afterwards I mentioned this before, but there's a trick that I like to use when I'm making these gaskets. So the bolts that we have are close enough to 16 mil. They're an imperial size. I think they're five eight from memory, but basically 16 mil is the right size to have a nice snug fit when you squeeze this gasket over top. Now, if you do a 16 mil hole all the way around in every single one of these holes, if you get your alignment not quite perfect, you end up stretching or trying to compress the rubber and you end up with wrinkles and it ends up being crap. It basically means that you've got a chance that there's a leakage there. So what I like to do is do a 16 mil hole top and bottom, or you can use like, if you've got say half inch bolts, do a half inch hole or a 13 mil hole, top and bottom, so that you can use that to align it. And then I like to go to the next size up for every other hole, because that way if there's a little bit of misalignment, it really doesn't matter because you're gonna have enough surface area to compress this and actually seal it up. But it does mean that you eliminate the possibility of there being wrinkles in the whole gasket surface area. See Dame's taking off the old cork gasket here. We want to use rubber here because we want to be able to go in and out of these tanks as much as we want to without having to do this. Dame started with a wire wheel, uh, but it was just smoothing it off. It wasn't rough enough, so he's gone on to using a sanding disc, which worked great. What the wire brush is great for though is cleaning off the threads. After cleaning up the threads, it's time for a bit of a vacuum and then a test fit to make sure it's going to work. because I want to be able to take these bolts off at a later date, they're all getting anti-seize.
and then nip these nuts up tight with the rattle gun. And then just to remove any guesswork, I go through with a torque wrench and tighten these up so that I know that I'm not relying solely on the rattle gun. Time to start sealing this up. Plenty of fuel proof sealant on this bung. Put the same sealant on this ball valve so that we can close this off as well. Put a bit more of the same sealant on the male and female parts of this thread. Up on deck level, we've got the same sort of vent arrangement as all the other tanks. So this is a gauze just to stop birds and monsters and stuff climbing down into the tank and likewise anything that grows in the tank from climbing out we obviously want to protect against that. But you can see this rubber seal that's sitting on this flange here is pretty knackered so we need to replace it. This face here squashes down onto that seal and that's never going to seal airtight so I need to put a new rubber seal on this so that we can basically have a decent pressure testing. The lid for this tank is just a screw on cap, it's quite nice, stainless, everything on it stainless. However there is a wee bit of paint around this back end here which does make it a wee bit hard to wind this on. So I might put a little bit of anti-seize on it and just wind it down over that paint and get rid of the paint so that we can then seal this up nice and tight. Alright, cleaned up, nice and tight, that shouldn't leak, hopefully. On either side of Brewpeg's lovely bottom, we have a bung fitting just here in the hull. This is into the starboard tank, and on the other side of the nozzle, we've got the equivalent going into the port tank. The port tank is the one that has a very slow weep coming out of it that I need to fix. So in order to pressure test this tank, I need to clean out the paint that got into these threads using a big old tap, clean that out, put the pressure testing rig in, and then I can start getting some pressure in to see if there's any leaks in this tank. Much better. Time to assemble the pressure testing rig onto this bung at the bottom so we can get around 2 psi of pressure into this tank. Alright, let's puff this up and see if we can actually do anything.
Right, let's see if it holds at that pressure. I think it's holding at that pressure, but we need to make sure the soapy water test comes up clean. Radio, soapy water, give it a good shake and then start spraying. I'm not expecting any of these to leak, but if they're gonna leak, you'll see bubbles forming wherever that hole is, and it's normally a pinhole. But I'm not seeing a thing. That looks clear as I'm happy with that. Likewise, these guys here, I'm not worried about the lids, I'm mainly worried about the welds. The lids are just thread tape if there's ever a leak on the lids. Pretty good. And then finally, the sight glass up the top here. Good. All right, let's have a look at this. Not that this really matters, because that's just tightening the bolts if it leaks. But it's important to spray this with soapy water so that all of the black rubbish that's on the um, rubber comes down and goes all over the engine room. As well as the dust, you can sort of see how much crap there is on the wall. So it's always a positive sign. I ran my fingers all the way around this trying to find where this leak was. I can hear a leak, but I can't necessarily see it. It's what went underneath. There's a hole up in here. I'm not a fuel tank guy, so I don't really know the point of that hole, but what I suspect is so that the tank can't overpressurize, it's always got to be able to exit that pressure. So get hot in the middle of the day, whatever it might be, in the middle of summer allows that pressure to vent out. This is just brake clean, just so that I can try and get the surface actually spotless for the uh, thread sealant. Same deal on the bung. We get one shot at making this seal up really, really good. In fuel systems, you want to use pipe sealant rather than a tape. Tapes can come loose, go into injectors and start really ruining things. Whereas a sealant like this, um, there's, there's no real molecules that are going to stick together so significant that they'll cause damage. It's just a safer way of doing fuel systems overall. But. Click, click. Now that I've checked everything, I'm pretty confident there's no leaks. I'm happy to transfer that fuel across from one tank to the other. All right, we're ready to go. So this is the port fuel tank. It's full of diesel and I need to transfer that. Now, I'm going to use the electric pump that I put together the other day with the pipes and switches and so on for our diesel suction out of the engine contraption that we built. Um, that's gonna form the basis of my transfer pump for now. This is not our long-term solution. This is just a temporary 12 volt thing. But I want to use our hot swap fuel filters. So these fuel filters allow us to filter diesel and swap between filters as we're going. So we don't have to physically stop the flow if one of them blocks up. And I want to run the fuel through this so that I know I'm putting nice clean fuel back into the new tank over there. All right, my elaborate system, 12 volt fuel pump here, pushing into our temporary fuel manifold on the hot swap filters. I'm just running it through the back filter at this stage, but then it's going out of the filters and up into the tank. You can sort of see over the back here, we've got a pipe going into the top of the tank. What I'm hoping is that I can push the fuel through the fuel filters and dump it in the top and then I'll be able to hear it pretty much that entire time that it's filling up so I know that it's working. Um, I won't have to be constantly guessing because I don't have a sight glass on that tank yet. I'm actually pushing it through the top fitting of what the sight glass would normally clip into. So I'm hoping you'll still see a few air bubbles come through this filter. That's fuel pressure before the filters. So we're getting about 11, just over 11, 11 and a half PSI, something like that. And then that's fuel pressure after the fuel filters. And we're seeing seven and a half PSI. 
bit of a quick sanity check. So this is the bung that I've fitted just before after we fresh tested everything. If there's any sort of diesel it'll show up around here, it'll run downwards, you'll get a stain. So it's not going to happen straight away, but we'll give it time. Diesel's a fantastic penetrant, so um, if you need to leak test and you can't pressure test something, diesel's often a really good way of doing it because you'll see that stain running down. So we'll look for that regardless. And that's how we figured out we have a slow leak on this other tank over here. This is what made us think that there's a leak here. You can see the bung itself, all the dirt from the yard is clung to it. That means there was some moisture that it clung to. Around you can see that it's all dry, there's nothing. But you can see a little run, it's been wiped off. But if you look closely, you can see a little run, and that's the diesel leak. Still going. Filters are doing good. They don't look too blocked, which is lovely. How much fuel have we got? Oh, we're down to here. Awesome. So we've probably got, I don't know, a couple of hundred litres. This is a thousand litres and that's 40 litres and because the tank is kind of triangle shaped I think we've probably got maybe two or three hundred litres left maybe, probably more, 400, something like that so we're getting pretty full over there which is positive Alright, so that is new diesel coming out you see there's a little drip just there and then that stain is basically the diesel running down I'm pretty confident it's coming out of the thread on this side this side here looks good but I'm pretty confident it's over here that it's leaking out what I think is the reason this is happening is I didn't give this stuff enough time to set. And thereby answering the age-old question of does diesel pressure test something better than soapy water? Yes, yes it does. One of the advantages of having a hot swap filter system like this is that we can change filters like I'm about to do now. We can change them whilst we're running. We don't have to turn the engine off or do anything like that. We can literally shut down one side and run off the opposing filter, rebuild you know, the one that shut down and then swap them back and forth. This is really handy when you're at sea and rubbish has been stirred up in your tank and you're blocking filters up you need to have a stockpile of filters on the shelf but you can just keep swapping them out without actually damaging the motor because no rubbish ends up getting to the motor but also it means you don't have to stop the engine so if you're against a lee shore or you know you're trying your best to keep it you know nose to the wind if you're in really rough conditions um, this is something that really matters but what i want to do is have a quick look see how much rubbish was in that fuel so that fuel let me tell you about it it was in the boat when the boat sunk and it's been so it's been underwater for two months uh, there was a lot of silt and rubbish that went in and out of the vents and stuff so there was silt in that tank um, it, i don't know if the silt was there before it sunk or if it went in there after it but either way there was a fair chunk of rubbish in there like sandy oily sand is probably how to describe it um, and it had been sitting for probably close to well it's been sitting for probably close to eight years and about two years ago um, we went and did some work on it. So we basically filtered it, we put it through our fuel processor. You can see here we're pumping it through our fuel processing system. This dries it, so it takes out any water content, um, and it also filters it down to one micron. We then sent it off to a lab to find out is this fuel worth saving? Like is it actually good enough to use or is it rubbish? Um, and it came back with the highest rating that they had, bar one. So it was like a, not an A plus, but an A rating. Um, the only thing that meant it didn't get A plus was the fact that it's high sulfur diesel. So you're not allowed to sell it in Australia because it's too old, it's got too much sulfur in it. So the fuel itself is in great condition. It had a huge amount of bug. You can sort of see here, this is what it was like originally before we did any of the work to it. So we're able to basically rescue fuel that was that bad. What I want to find out is if there's any rubbish or crud or junk on these filters. And that is looking pretty clean. I didn't know what to expect. I assumed it would be pretty good. Um, it has been sitting for a while in that tank, but that filter looks perfect. There's nothing wrong with that. So we'll just pop that back in. If there was any bug that had grown in the, in the year and a half that it's been sitting in that tank since we processed it, it would have gone through this filter and you'd see it on that filter, you'd see specks of rubbish. Um, it's, it's oftentimes black, sometimes it can be grey. It almost looks like tiramisu, the, the dessert tiramisu. It's like a creamy sort of texture sometimes. Um, so yeah, it's bug is an interesting thing, but it's not the end of the world. It's pretty easy to solve. And um, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that. Means that we're able to keep the fuel and brew pig in a decent condition just with simple treatment and with our fuel processing system. So that gives me heaps of confidence for the future. Because we've got that leak happening on the starboard tank that I'm pretty confident is coming out of the thread because the thread sealant wasn't given enough time to set, my bad. I'm, I'm actually thinking that that's exactly what's going on inside this tank. Everything else seems to be working perfectly fine. The welds seem to be holding up great. 
um, but it is seeping out and it's looking exactly the same as the other tank. So what I'm going to do is open this tank up. There'll be a little bit of diesel sitting in the very bottom that I can't get out with the pump system. Um, so I'm going to use the vacuum pump and we'll just pull that last little bit out. But it also gives us a chance to have a look at this tank. This diesel that's been in here has been sitting for, I don't know, probably 12 months, 18 months, something like that at a guess. Um, so it gives us a chance to actually look at the condition of the tank and how it's been with the diesel sitting in there, how it's actually been. Um, now I won't have very long inside each tank because diesel's you know, able to get into everything. So I'm going to be wearing filters and everything, but those filters are not going to last. So I'll have a very limited window once I'm inside that tank. Um, thankfully, I don't have to do much. I have to literally just climb in and vacuum out the amount of diesel that's left. I'm thinking it's probably going to be about maybe 10 litres, something like that. Um, but I won't know until I climb in there. Um, if it's more than that, I probably won't try and get it all out with the vacuum pump. I'll probably try and figure a different way. Uh, but what I'm thinking is, yeah, empty that out, clean up the thread on that last bung, and then uh, brake clean the thread, give it a real good like clean out, make sure it's spotless, and then put some thread seal on, leave it for a day, and then start filling this back up with diesel. I don't necessarily have to pressure test this tank, because I know this tank doesn't have leaks anywhere else. It's had diesel sitting in it for long enough that it would have come out those holes had it had holes anywhere else. So I'm going to use diesel to test this once I've put that bung back in with the right amount of sealant and the right time for it to set and all that sort of stuff. So, so I'll probably just um, chuck 20 litres in and cover up that bung and then leave it a day or so and see if it actually leaks out. If it doesn't, we're good to go. can fill the tank up the rest of the way. I really need a welder handle onto those. Right, well that held on quite well. Oh yeah! First look for you guys inside this tank. So, it's been sitting for a long time. You see that sort of build up of rubbish on the ground? There's a lot of like rust and uh, sand and crap and things like that. Interesting. I was surprised by how much rubbish is in that tank because a while ago when we cleaned that tank out, we got in there with scrapers and chisels and absolutely demolished anything that was hanging onto the steel, then water blasted the bejeebas out of the tank. So it was absolutely spotless when we put the fuel in there and the fuel was filtered going into that tank. So I know that rubbish hasn't come from the filter, it's come from the tank. The tank has been sealed off, so the, so the, you know, the filler has been sealed up and the, and the vent itself has been nice and tight. So I know that there's no external rubbish that's got into that tank. Um, so yeah, it's just really surprising, I thought, by how much junk just sort of accumulates in the tank from you know, surface rust and things like that. It's pretty normal for those tanks to be unpainted because as that diesel sloshes around, diesel stops rust basically. So the only place that the rust potentially could have happened would have been the very top of the tank from potentially condensation or whatever because the, the fuel wasn't right to the very top of the tank. We can't actually get it right to the top because there's ribs and things that stop us. Um, but yeah, just, I think that's really interesting. I'm not worried about it because it's a huge tank and it's kind of a tight by volume. It's a tiny amount of rubbish. The filters will easily deal with it. But um, yeah, just still surprising. Right, now that there's no diesel in the tank, I should be able to get this bung out. Okay, it's set to several ooga doogers. Right, I need to revise that plan.
avoid. Bucket loads of cleaning this time. There's a stain up on this side here, which to me almost looks like where the leaks sort of came through, the thread sealant not being good enough. What I'm thinking is I'll absolutely nuke the thread sealant on, on the actual female part and then put some on the male part as well. I think maybe I just didn't put enough on and I didn't give it time to set, or enough time to set, but I think maybe that was the actual cause of this. rubbish so yeah there we go wee bit of metal so you can sort of see here it's nice and clean and clear you come around there you can sort of see there's like rubbish stains and whatever the thread tap goes up and down nicely so i know we've got a clean thread but i'm not quite sure why it's warped over on that side maybe it's a welding ah oh, it's a blooming welding thing that's what it would be and it's not sealing up because of it all right we need to put a lot more thread sealing in okay let's try this again plenty of thread sealant on both threads we like learning through our own experience, including our mistakes. We find it really helpful. We know that a lot of people think that that means we don't know what we're doing, we're incompetent. Most channels don't put their mistakes on like this. We actually find it really helpful. Uh, it certainly teaches us to keep our eyes open and to keep learning. Yep, and a heap on that bit there. Really don't want to have to pull this apart again, so let's try and do it right the first time, eh? leaking dramatically but it is definitely leaking you can sort of see this little yellow colored dribble that's the fresh diesel we've just put in and that stain is very very slowly growing so yeah what I'm going to do is basically transfer the fuel out of this tank across to the other side tomorrow once the other side's had a good amount of time to set up here it's actually set really quite well where it's not getting diesel to it it's, it's actually set quite well so I do have faith in this thread sealant I just didn't use it right and that's why this one didn't work so um, now that I've got my fuel transfer system working all right I'll just swap the fuel over tomorrow but uh, I'll give that tank a clean out while I've got it apart. It's been 24 hours and this should theoretically have been set. I want to pressure test this but I need to know if it's going to leak and as Whitney Houston famously asked when she was doing a very similar job I believe how will I know? Don't trust your feelings. How will I know? I'll know because I'm going to use diesel to find any holes. Because we've got a full tank of fuel here and an empty tank of fuel there, I don't need a pump to transfer it across. I can rely on gravity to basically push it across. I'm gonna put a pipe between this ball valve and this one here. Um, and because I've got two ball valves, I can control the flow pretty easily if I ever need to. But I'm also gonna take the access hatch off this tank. I can physically see the fuel going in. I only want a puddle about that big, just above that bung so that I can tell if that bung's holding up. I'm pretty sure it will. Um, but yeah, that's my pressure test is, is essentially using diesel as a penetrant to push through. I don't need physical pressure. I'm going to use a penetrant of diesel um, to get through and see if we've got any holes. If that passes the test, that tank um, is ready to be you know, signed off in terms of we know that we can seal it up again. So I'll quickly throw a pipe onto these two ball valves using a bit of thread sealant so we don't have any crazy leaks in the engine room. And then we're good to transfer this fuel.
So I'm not gonna know if this is gonna leak unless I do a long-term look at this bung. So I think I'll set up a time-lapse and walk away and carry on with something else. As eventful as this time-lapse is, it was actually shot over two and a half hours. And no leaks, I'm happy with this. A few things haven't necessarily gone the way that we thought they would. We've had a few issues with the motor. We're gonna change it out. We will take our little Cummins out, put a Detroit diesel in. I haven't wanted to say this, been a little bit embarrassed, but that's what we've decided. Okay, none of that's true. I took an exorbitant amount of money from a company in America to say that. It's all a lie, I sold out to the man. I wanna show you some things on Brewpeg's engine. So she's originally a truck engine. And as a result, there's a couple of really unique things going on here. As many of you know, Brewpeg's main engine is a Cummins 855 Big Cam. It started life as a truck engine. Now, the issue between a truck engine and a marine engine, technically they're the same engine. However, truck engines have some unique challenges that aren't present on most marine or industrial engines. Compared to a marine industrial engine, a truck engine goes through a very different life. It gets a lot more heat cycling. What do I mean by that? So you start up in the morning, stone cold, the engine is you know, at ambient temperature, and then you bring the engine up to operating temperature. You drive for a couple of hours, you stop, you go over coffee, etc. you turn your motor off, you're inside the shop, whatever, for 10, 15 minutes. The engine starts to cool back down. Then you go back out, you start the engine up again, it heats back up again, and then you're off again driving. So that's one part of it. You've got that thermal cycling like that. You've also got the twisting and torque applied to the block, so going up and down hills. Going up a hill, hauling a big weight, you've got a lot of torque moment put on that engine. When you're going down a hill, it's going the other way. The exhaust brakes are trying to twist the engine in the opposite direction. So you've got a lot of twisting going on in that engine that wouldn't normally be there in a boat. Trucks also have a bit more possibility for overloading as well. So I'm not saying people speed or that people overload their trucks, but it can happen. And if it does happen, most of that force is transmitted into the engine in some way or form. What that means for the engine is if you're really giving it a hard time, you can actually pound the liners into the block. So the, the liners themselves start to sink down into the block. Um, another thing that's quite common on particularly older mechanical injection engines like this, back in the day when these were quite common in trucks, it was pretty normal to actually screw up a bit more fuel pressure out of the fuel pump and start firing in more fuel into the cylinders. Now, this is neat, if you're the driver, it gives you more horsepower. However, it's at the expense of the engine. So what it does is it tends to overheat the cylinders. So you can bump it up a little bit safely, but a lot of people sort of did it in a you know, roundabout way. They put a lot more horsepower into the engine and risk the internals of the engine. So essentially overheating a cylinder can uh, end up with cracked pistons, can end up with more strain on those liners getting pounded down. Um, there's a few other things that can happen, but the reason why I'm touching on those is it's exactly what's happened to Brewpeg. When a truck came in with a blown head gasket, it was pretty standard that it was because these liners have been pushed down. And these circular shims here would get put on top of the liner like that, and then you put the head gasket back together and it, you push the truck out the door and off you go again, and you're, you're good to go. The reason why it happened wasn't fixed, it was basically just a band-aid for the liner itself sinking down into that block. The second thing going on with these pistons that I missed, but a viewer picked up, is a crack happening in number five. So if I scoot down in there like that, look at that, dirty big crack in number five piston. And then also conversely over on this side here, I think I saw one just starting, just starting there, you can just make it out. So does this mean that this engine is stuffed? Well, no. Every single thing that I've shown you is repairable. The question is, is it worth repairing? In an ideal world, we would have had enough money to just go and buy the right engine, which would be a, you know, a late model, Big Cam 3, marine rated engine. It would have been rebuilt. We would have known everything about it. We would have put it in and honky dory, we would never have a problem with that engine practically. But you know, life and cash flow sometimes don't work like that. Uh, we did the best that we could. We managed to get a complete running engine for five grand, which was a pretty good price when we bought this engine. Um, it does have problems and it's probably to be expected. You know, it's a truck engine, uh, you know, they, uh, it's 40 years old. They get a hiding when they're that old um, and it was pretty cheap. So, you know, like in, in hindsight, it would have been nice to, to do something different, but we did what we could. And this motor is actually gonna go back together and will get us launched. However, we are going to plan for an upgrade. Now, there's a reason we don't have to upgrade straight away. We thought this engine combo was about 220 horsepower. We were wrong. Because we've changed this fuel pump, and because we now know more about the injectors, we've had them serviced, and we know what their CC rating and everything is, we actually know that this engine will be about 300 to 320 horsepower. So we'll have enough horsepower to get this boat easily um, you know, to hull speed and so on. 
we're not going to push this engine hard because we know it's got a cracked piston. So we know that the other four, there's probably something going on with those. It's pretty unlikely that only one piston will be a problem. If it's that bad, it's going to be, you know, amongst the other pistons. What are we doing with this engine? We're basically going to put this engine back together and we're going to get the boat launched. And behind the scenes, we're going to start trying to fund a proper rebuild of a marine rated Cummins 855. We're going to stick with the same engine. We may have found one. We're not sure yet. Um, but it'll need a full rebuild and it is potentially a complete marine engine. So stay tuned on that. That's something that we, we will be doing uh, in the future. Exactly how we do that, we're not sure. Time for a marina update. The guys have been really busy over on the water. They're moving the concrete walkways into position. This is the center line of the new marina. It plugs up to the very first concrete pontoon that they've got in there already. This is how they lift them in and out with a big steel frame that they've built to pick each one up. Once it's lowered down into the water they connect up this boat that's purpose built for this job and then they can tow it out of the holding area and move it out across the water to the new marina. With the waterworks getting more complete, it's time to start doing some of the land infrastructure. Here they're digging out the bank so they can put a concrete block in there ready to install the ramp. This is what the ramp looks like when it's in place. All the piles and all of the pontoons are now in place. It's time to start setting out the electrical gear. With the waterworks side of it finished, they're getting rid of the orange barges. They don't need this and that's off to another job now. With the electrical install complete, that's a marina. Our mate Tom the welder has been working on this green trawler in the bay, a lot of stainless going on that, as well as trying to put the innards back in the blue one that had the innards removed. The next job on his list is this gorgeous blue trawler beside Brewpeg, Miss Shelley. She's getting a new X15 Cummins fitted to her, as well as a whole bunch of new keel cooling pipes. And then finally, Brewpeg waits patiently to have the bow welded back up. 